Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another episode of the Level Up Hour. I am Chris Short, executive producer of OpenShift TV. I am joined by a bunch of red hatters this morning. Uh, people I have had on the channel before and new people, so it's great to have them all. But I will hand it over to the one and only, the illustrious Langdon White. I think I've been on the show before. Right? Yes, you have. on the channel uh, here and there. Um, so just in case anybody wasn't sure uh, who you might be referring to. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, quickly introduce the show, and then I'll ask uh, our guests to kind of introduce themselves. Uh, as I co often comment on the show, uh, Red Hat is notorious for changing group names and changing role names and all that stuff. So keeping track of what someone's like current title and who what like part of the company they work for uh, is often entertaining and challenging. Um, but you know we do what we do uh it's funny because uh it's so often our job doesn't change just everything around it uh and so we're kind of like oh all right so we're now part of this group um so we'll do that in two seconds uh but as always i like to share my amazing artwork of my slides uh no fault to the designers who actually design the graphics uh this is just my cobbled together uh version uh from their good sources um, so this is the level up hour where we talk about uh, containers and we talk about uh, why uh, you who may or may not have any familiarity with containers really should get familiar with them because they're super handy. They're not just like another load of hype uh, and they are really useful even when you're just using them uh, for, uh, you know, kind of, you know, we've, we've had episodes about tools containers and about, um, you know, kind of running your own personal services and, you know, all kinds of different things. They're great. They're really, really useful. They're so much easier than a VM. Um, and uh, so we hope to convince you. Um, and then, uh, oh, today I forgot, uh, Chris Short is back. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, but uh, last week we had, uh, or I guess two weeks ago now, uh, we had yeah. Andrew Sullivan was uh, hosting the show with me because Chris went off and took a vacation. Uh, can you believe it? I know. it's it, Well, no, last week was vacation. The week before that was Necky oh so, yeah, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. was even worse. Oh, right. yeah. um, so, uh, so yes, I forgot to update the slide, but Chris is back with uh, the Twitter handle where you can always find us, uh, Chris Short. My Twitter handle is Langdon uh, with a one. But feel free to ask Andrew Sullivan uh, whatever you like about the show <laughs> because it will entertain the both of us to no end. Uh, or you can also come to his show, The Open Shift Admin, which I believe is on and in two hour, hours. Yeah. Two hours from now. Um, and uh, you can ask him about our show there, uh, which would also be <laughs> which would be hilarious, <laughs> right? right. Uh, but you can also join us on our Discord, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I assume you're doing the magic Discord yep, link in the chat, uh, and so uh, you can find us there. Um, you know, we kind of have uh, dribs and drabs of conversation. Uh, we uh, we also have been uh, we've been told by our corporate or overlords that we also need to say, uh, you know. Click like and subscribe down below uh, much more often. Yeah, wherever uh, you're so. watching us from, please subscribe and follow whatever it is. Yes. Right, whatever whatever technology you're using, uh, that way we can uh, we can show how awesome the show is uh, to everybody else who like numbers about things. Uh, and uh, feel free to uh, ask us questions in the chat at any time. Uh, we try to keep track uh, as much as we can. So from last time, uh, which, yeah, two weeks ago, last week was Summit, um, so we didn't have a show, uh, but the week before that, we talked about the Container Health Index, which is a feature of play, um, and I thought that episode was quite interesting, not only from, wait, this didn't update. Um, sorry, so this says the Container Health Index is today's episode, but it's not. Uh, mm -hmm. Today's episode is about Tackle and Conveyor, uh, and we'll talk about that in two seconds. The link to the show notes from the last episode is uh, the exact same thing you see here, except it's E37, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, it's weird how the, I, I wonder if the slides didn't update in general, because I just edited them, but they didn't seem to take. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will make sure to stop and restart them before we start the next thing so that the uh, points are right. So starting off, uh, let's see. Uh, Ramon, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Because you are at the top of my screen. Absolutely. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ramon Roman Nissen. I am the current product manager for the Migration Toolkit for Applications, which is the current downstream distribution 
uh, for well the 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 future downstream distribution uh, for Taco, the the tool from the conveyor community. Nice. And uh, sorry, and uh, Phil, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. My name is Phil Katanak. I'm an engineering manager that works in the middleway department of Red Hat. Uh, I'm responsible for the development of the Windup tool, which gets uh, productized as the migration toolkit for applications. And my engineering team have all also been all working on the Tackle project within the conveyor community uh, for the last six months. Uh, and we're very close to a first release. Cool. Uh, that's always that's always a nice uh, feature. We were talking about swag before the show started. Will there be cool t-shirts uh, for, for launch day? Uh, I don't think we've got t-shirts arranged yet, have we? There, I don't think we have anything planned around that. Sorry, sorry to say. It's not the Red Hat way. This, you, know, you really <laughs> need to think about uh, what, what swag you'll be doing. Uh, I still, uh, well, in, when it's a little colder out, I still wear my uh, release of uh, RHEL 7 jacket, uh, which is super nice. So, um, you know, it's something to consider. Uh, we're always, I'm always about the swag. So... Uh, why don't you tell us a little about, about like kind of, or, you know, either one of you, you know, what kind of is the goal here? So not necessarily, and we're trying to talk primarily about tackle because I think we have some of your, uh, you know, compatriots, I guess, uh, on the conveyor project because conveyor is actually like a bunch of different projects on future episodes. So kind of what is specifically tackle about? Okay, cool. So uh, Tackle is a tool set that is aimed at the uh, application refactoring, uh, migration, modernization towards uh, Kubernetes. The idea is to help users out there to leverage all the different features that Kubernetes provides for application development and lifecycle management in general. Okay. And why, like, like, and so what does it do to kind of try to solve that problem? Like, what is it about like you know what's the why can't i just you know go flip a switch somewhere what do, what do i have to do what's involved in uh bringing an application onto kubernetes um okay yeah uh well the the idea of of tackle is providing some sort of guidance for for users basically what we have right now is a set of uh automated analysis tools that go down the, the source code of the or the binaries of, of the uh, uh, different applications you want to migrate and provide some hints on how to actually perform this kind of, of migration. We are also adding uh, some other tools. For example, we are about to release the application inventory, which is something uh, aimed at you know, helping users out there go bear in their, their own uh, application landscape. An application portfolio. So the idea is to have everything, you know, in in one place and have some integration between the different uh, uh, analysis and assessment tools that we have within Tackle. So that's it for the analysis. We are also adding a lot of, you know, very cool, very sci-fi, I would say, uh, analysis tools coming from uh, IBM Research, which is uh, our partner in in crime uh, in in this tool. And also we are adding an assessment tool. You might be familiar with the name Pathfinder, which is an assessment tool that was originally developed in Red Hat Consulting. And what we are doing right now is uh, basically rebuilding it from scratch and uh, sharing it uh, with the uh, Tackle community. And it's something that if everything goes well, will be available in a couple of weeks uh, out there. So I, I noticed you said IBM Research. Do you have to like pay twenty five cents or something to say Watson? Um, or uh, I'm very impressed. <laughs> you didn't no, use that term. No, no. For the moment, uh, we don't have anything related to to Watson, but we are definitely leveraging the uh, the knowledge that the IBM Research guys have about uh, AI. Mm -hmm. So lots of AI, lots of very scientific, uh, mathematical stuff apply to, to this problem space, which is really, really, really cool. So we're partnering her, here. They are providing the, the muscle and the brain to develop this, this kind of, uh, I would say, revolutionary approaches to the problem space. And we provide uh, our knowledge in, in this kind of mm -hmm. uh, larger scale migration projects we have been doing for years. Yeah, I would yeah so just, just, just oh, responding sorry. to that a little bit more, Landon, you were talking about uh, artificial intelligence. So, um, one of the things that's getting released shortly as part of Tackle is the application inventory, and that's like a hub for the application modernization and migration process. So it's a central repository of applications, you know, your portfolio of applications really as a customer, 
and it allows you to assess them um, to a questionnaire-based tool, which is Pathfinder, or analyze them through WindUp, and um, so we'll automated code analysis to try and figure out which ones are good candidates for uh, containerization and migration onto Kubernetes, and which ones potentially have sort of cloud native anti patterns that need to be remediated before you could consider migrating them across. And one of the tools that the IBM guys are working on is a thing called Application Container Advisor. And that's going to be using uh, AI to um, take characteristics of the applications in terms of which um, software components they're built on top of, and then um, sort of recommend which container base image could be used to host those applications. And um, so that's a really solid example of AI. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, basically by using, uh, or I would imagine, right, using, you know, some sort of machine learning around um, like prior art, essentially. So where it's been successful in the past, you're likely to be successful in the future kind of idea. So for Correct. the moment, the, the AI is more focused on understanding natural language. So you, you basically describe the application using natural language, using a, a, a tech model that we have built uh, within the application inventory. But yes, uh, like you said, this machine learning piece is a roadmap for them. So they want to be able to learn from previous decisions in order to recommend uh, different container images to containerize your applications. Yes. Right, right. Um, so I think uh, just kind of for the audience to kind of wrap their head around this, can um, maybe one of you share um, like where where do I start? Like what's that kind of mm. first screen to kind of wrap your head around kind of what you would be approaching this problem of? You know, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you start more from the portfolio side or do you start from one individual application side? Mm. Yeah, so um, I mean, I can share my screen any set, any, if you would like me to, Langman. So essentially, uh, yeah, the first thing to do, I think, is to uh, import or manually import uh, a collection of applications and add some characteristics that describe those applications. So if I may, I'll share my screen just to, just to give you a flavor of what the application is. Yeah, yeah I think that'll be good. Yeah, okay then. Okay then, so hopefully you can see my screen. I'll just. Mm -hmm. um, a bit more presentable. So what we have here is um, one of our test environments, which uh, has the application inventory application installed. And what you can see here is a list of applications um, that have already been manually imported the application um, through the UI or being imported through um, a file import process. And um, each application has a name, um, it has a description, and it's linked to a business service. So um, Business service is just a bit of metadata that it helps describe which business service this application supports. Um, and are those, are, the, sorry, are those like arbitrary? Yeah. Are those, okay, so like I can kind of say, okay, I have these various groupings of applications within my portfolio. Okay. Yes, yeah. That's so, a, so if you exactly. were to say a retail bank uh, and you'd, you'd have things like, you know, retail lending to customers for mortgages, uh, home insurance, personal loans, all these sorts of things, you could create a separate business service for each of those different sort of verticals within your overall organization. Um, and then you would link the applications to which verticals um, those applications contribute towards. That's that's the idea behind them, yeah? Gotcha, okay. And um, once you expand on these applications, you can see a little bit more detail about them. I'll just I'll click on one that's been assessed already. Um, so the idea is that we have this extensible tagging model that allows users to categorize the applications in as many dimensions as they want. Um, and we can group tags together into, um, into groups we call tag types. So we could say, uh, and, and I'll show you how those, th those tag types are presented. Actually, I'll, I'll just click over to the controls. So the controls is a, is a set of um, control data that add, add value to uh, the application inventory itself or to uh, the assessment process. Um, most interesting one of the controls is five in total is the tags. Um, so basically tags are grouped into uh, tag types and then each within each tag type you have several different tags. Um, we do supply a pre-shipped set of tag types and tags uh, but obviously the customer is totally at liberty to replace them and add to the, add their own that kind of thing so they can add as many dimensions to their applications as they want. Um, and this is a good example. Kind of this is you can kind of go into okay so here's where like so how like how do i use those tags like how do i can i go see an application view based on the tags 
yeah, so so essentially, the, the, just, if I just demonstrate the tags, then I'll go back to the application inventory and you can see how we leverage them. Mm -hmm. So essentially, um, I've created, you know, five different tags on the database tag type for the different flavors of database that are out there. You know, um, obviously, typically an application will, uh, will be using one or other of these sort of databases for uh, persisting data. Um, if I go back to the application inventory um, and I want to look for applications that use um, a particular database type, I would search for date tag. And um, then I would just it. nip through the list of available tags on the drop down list. You can see the tag type is qualified underneath. So we've got operating systems and all these sorts of things, runtimes, databases. So if I wanted to look at my DB2 based applications, this would give me the subset of applications that contain. DB2, yeah? And if I wanted to further distill that down to find those applications that run on the, on the ZOS operating system, again, I would just look for um, ZOS as well as the operating system right there. And then I get an even smaller list, yeah? The, once you've expanded this, say expanded. Yeah, so that's a subset of applications that uh, run on ZOS and use DB2 as their, as their database management system. So this is kind of at the portfolio planning level, right? So yeah. you would imagine that this is the this is the uh, purview, for lack of a better word, of like an enterprise architect, right, um, or yes. someone like that, right? Like you, would you expect a developer to be in this application, or is that is it more like the enterprise architect is going to lay out a? I mean, so. I used to work for a consulting company. We had this uh, product, right? Consulting companies have weird products sometimes called Surveyor. And where we would come in after we say, you know, after management consultant came in and told you some crazy plan, we would come in and tell you how to actually implement that plan, you know, with your technology choices. Um, and so we would lay out, you know, multi-year uh, project plans of portfolios or whatever. And, and so is that kind of what you're, that's what you're kind of envisioning here, right? It's like to get, to be able to keep track of everything that's in place so that you can kind of say, okay, we're gonna do some modernization here. We're gonna retire this thing there. Um, and then if it was modernization, then you would hand that thing off to some sort of development team to go and actually do that work, right? Exactly, exactly. The the idea for, for the inventory, well, actually it's something that has been uh, requested from, from the field for, for years. I, I myself have requested having something like that. I come from Red Hat Consulting. I've been mm -hmm. doing this kind of migration projects for for almost five years uh, out there, uh, you know, larger scale migration projects towards uh, different application servers or OpenShift adoption projects. So one of the key things here is to be able to govern the uh, the landscape and, and the whole uh, application portfolio. So having this, let's say, central hub that is integrated with the analysis and the assessment tools allows the uh, consultants in the field and, you know, any architect that is leading this kind of transformation process uh, to have a holistic view of the whole application portfolio that needs to be uh, analyzed and migrated. So uh, with this holistic view, you're able to identify uh, risks as early as possible to, you know, get details that span across the whole portfolio in order to design a migration uh, process as, you know, as uh, uh, realistic as possible and, and to make sure that it, it can be re reliable and predictable enough for, for the whole migration project. So that's, that's it for the, uh, let's say, enterprise architect role for the uh, actual migrators or, or developers that perform the, the migration once everything has been assessed and analyzed. Well, uh, we have some IDE plugins uh, coming from the WindUp code base uh, mm -hmm. that integrate with the IDE and, and basically tell you what exactly what needs to be changed at, at code level. So that's one thing. Uh, but also in the future, we're thinking about uh, providing some integration from this uh, application inventory, maybe with some tools like Jira or something like that. These kind of tools that... Uh, developers are more used to interact with in order to, let's say you create some sort of migration wave or sprint uh, within the application inventory, and then you are able to export is, it as issues on Jira for, for developers to take them and perform the actual changes. So that's something we want to do. 
So, so one thing at least that occurred to me from a kind of a developer or, uh, you know, even like, you know, kind of not the enterprise level architect, but kind of the systems architects that are, that are working with these migrations. Um, this might also be a good discovery tool. And in some ways, uh, also the anti discovery tool in that, um, you know, kind of using that DB2 example, uh, you know, DB2 is set to be sunsetted, right? We want to get off that. We want to migrate to, you know, something else. I don't know. Um, and so what it might be useful also to be able to say is like, as a system architect, when I'm trying to plan that new migration of the new application is to know, okay, this service is, uh, doesn't exist yet, but it's planned. Uh, so, you know, go make sure you work with that team. So don't you develop the same thing. Uh, or this service is available and is meant for long-term usage. Oh, and this service, uh, even though you discovered it, it looks like it's perfect for what you want, is set to be sunsetted. So don't go building it into your new application. So that was kind of one thought I've had, uh, you know, I've seen this uh, application, you know, once or twice, but it might be nice if you could use it for some level of discovery around around, um, you know, how you're going to do the application migration more than just, you know, because, you know, it's always a fine line of whether you're going to do what, you know, is often referred to as like a lifted shift, you know, migration, or you're actually going to do some level of application modernization or, you know, whatever you want to call that. But basically, you know, getting, getting your environment more holistic over time you know, or, or simplified really, uh, you know, always helps. And so having, using a tool like that might be an interesting way to be able to see what, what services are available that I could take advantage of so that I could do more like a modernization app or, or modernization activity on this application rather than the planned lift and shift with you know, the same amount of effort. Uh, so that was one thing that occurred to me. Yeah, well, we're not planning to, uh, you, uh, you know, we're not thinking about, uh, making this uh, application inventory become some sort of CMDB. The, the, mm -hmm. You know, the idea is to keep it focused on the migration process. Uh, for the moment, it, it is not only applications. Uh, what we load up in, into the application inventory, we can also uh, uh, load up some uh, dependencies. And uh, yeah, the concept of the dependencies between applications or applications uh, uh, with a, a third-party kind of middleware or database or something like that. That concept already exists on the tool. And uh, what we intend to do with Pathfinder is, you know, have some sort of guided, uh, guided process uh, to help users decide what they want to do regarding the, the, the you know, the, the well-known six R's for uh, application migration strat strategy. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Uh, do you want to do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, so, you know, kind of maybe where you're at. Well, just demonstrating the, the, just what the, the questionnaire looks like, uh, Ramon, and the... Um, yeah, I think so, the, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just share my screen again. Let me share my screen. Right. Okay, then. So um, I'll, I'll just... I just changed the section criteria. I'll just clear the filters, and uh, I've, we've got a business service that's been set up that's got a number of applications related to motor insurance. This is just test data, yeah. Um, but essentially, um, with each application, um, what we what we expect users to do is group applications together, and then those that have shared common characteristics complete a questionnaire that is representative of them all. Um, and that informs the risks associated with trying to migrate these applications across uh, to enterprise Kubernetes. So um, to go into the questionnaire process, you just need to select any individual application and click the assess button. And um, it takes you into this assessment process. And um, basically there's, there's two, there's a first page which allows you to define the group of people who have been involved in the assessment. So um, it could be individual stakeholders that you want to add to the um, to the actual assessment process, and um, or it could be stakeholder groups that you've predefined. So I've, I've got this predefined stakeholder group that's a collection of stakeholders, stakeholders that represents the audit security and project office, for example. Yeah, I've got another group of stakeholders that are linked to the Mortisure business function. Yeah. Um, and then once you've selected who's involved in the assessment process, and this just gives you an audit trail of who was leading the engagement and who's been contributing to the engagement. So retrospectively, you can be sure that the right people have attended and made their contribution to the assessment process. Then you go through a series of questions that are 
grouped into categories that allow you to drill into uh, the, 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 the characteristics of these applications and how they're supported and the, you know, uh, how frequently they're deployed, all these sorts of things. And most of these questions are multiple choice answers. And the way the question data is configured is depending upon the answers, um, risks will be raised. You know, there'll be some answers that are sort of green category, some that are amber category, some that are red category. And these sort of bring, raise flags about the suitability of these applications uh, for containerization. As a consequence of driving one of these engagements, what will happen is the, the person leading the engagement will naturally solicit information out of the, the group of attendees who are contributing to the process. And they're about to get information that can't be just, just um, um, you know, encapsulated by a single radio button on a single question. So for every single questionnaire, there's all, every single section of the questionnaire, there's additional notes or comments section, and you'd expect uh, this to be populated with information that is solicited from the conversation, yeah? So ultimately, when all the questions have been answered, is essentially the, the assessment questionnaire is complete and the users must go into the sort of next step in the process, which is the review process. Uh, so if I just go back to the application inventory and I choose the Holio one again, sorry, and just click on the review button, what you will see here is essentially um, it, the, the, the outcome of the assessment. Um, you know, these, this sort of pie chart represents uh, the responses and in terms of the, the amount of risks and the type of risks that have been sort of raised as a result of the questionnaire. As you can see, this whole year back end um, uh, application seems to be a very good candidate for um, uh, migrating onto Kubernetes. And then what the business, what the users are expected to do based upon the risks that have been surfaced, uh, and these are the sort of risks that get surfaced from the question answers combinations, um, is make a decision about um, this application in terms of what the proposed action is, uh, how much work's involved, and also categorize the application in terms of its business criticality and the priority of migrating this particular application compared to other applications in the portfolio, yeah? It also gives the users the, the ability to add some free format comments, which um, sort of helps provide some qualification as to why some of these particular values have been chosen from the drop-down lists, yeah? So that all makes sense? Yeah, and then once once all of these um, once these things have been once the review has been complete, um, again I'll just just choose a subset of the applications. So I'll go back to those more sure ones. Yeah, um, you can click on the reports function, and the reports function gives you a nice overview of those applications that satisfy this filter criteria in terms of their. Uh, uh, suitability, which ones are low, medium, and high risk. It gives you a nice tabular view of those applications in terms of uh, their criticality, their priority, the de degree of confidence that you have that they're suitable for, for um, rehosting or refactoring or whatever. Um, and also a nice adopted adoption plan, um, which takes into consideration uh, both the application dependencies. So um, for example, um, uh, this particular application here, the front end for the core generator, depends upon the auth authentication application. So um, the it's like a Gantt chart essentially, and the the length of the bars are reflective of how much effort was allocated to each application, which is one of those fields that you populate during the review process. And then the, then these things are ordered in business priority, with dependencies taken into consideration. Yeah, so it starts to give the user, you know high level plan of which applications to migrate in which order and realistically how much time they need to ring fence for each particular application. And Does that make so, sense? Yeah. And uh, so specifically around the dependencies part of it, uh, what I'm curious about is like, uh, does the risk factor or effort factor take into account um, as part of kind of its input, the number of dependencies? Um, you know, does that kind of increase or low? Because I would think that that would increase its score, like as in make it harder to to migrate um, than. The, yeah, there are some specific questions around um, around the dependencies, and uh, obviously they will 
uh, influence, whether it's high risk, low risk, medium risk. There isn't any logic in the application at the moment that is specific about counting the number of dependencies and then um, elevating or decreasing the risk based upon uh, that count. But it, it is a good idea, uh, Langdon. So I think I'll put that in the back log. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I said, I, I've done a bunch of these scary uh, activities. Um, but uh, it, kind of a related question. So you were mentioning kind of AI uh like around natural language or whatever is that applied here is that is this where that proposed you know not yet obviously but um not yet, I not say, not yet. yeah no. that's it we are in we were starting to entertain the idea with uh, our uh, ibm research uh, colleagues so this is something you know that came from a meeting a couple of days ago so uh oh, since yeah, yeah. they have this machine learning... they should have all the answers now already it's yeah been, yeah, yeah. It's it's, like 24 it's... hours so, uh, yeah, no, the thing is, uh, since they are building this machine learning engine for the uh, container recommendations, mm -hmm. uh, we are thinking about using this same kind of engine to provide recommendations on whether to rehost through the platform or refactor your application. So we want to have some AI support here for recommendations about which path to follow for the moment. It is the, the, the user, after gathering all the different risks uh, that have been raised uh, after doing the, the questionnaire, it is the user, the one that decides which path to follow. In the future, we want the system to be able to provide recommendations based on both the output of the questionnaire and previous outputs and, and decisions made by, by the user or other users within the same migration project. I would actually, yeah. So basically the reason I was thinking about it was um, two things. One was, as you, Phil, as you were kind of explaining, is like, as you're, and I, I laughed when you said this, is like when you're, especially coming in as a consultant. So you you come in, right, and you're having this uh, portfolio conversation, right? Um, and like, I have literally sat outside someone's office door for multiple days, uh, just sitting there waiting for them to have time to meet with me. Um, you know, it's and a classic. It, it's very clear <laughs> it's how many hundreds of dollars an hour they're paying for me to sit there outside his office doing nothing. Um, but so sometimes it's like pulling teeth, but the the comments section that you were kind of saying, I think that's a really important part, right? Because you like and, and maybe even worth kind of even building upon where uh, you often capture a lot of information there that isn't strictly relevant all the time immediately or might be later or whatever. But I was just thinking is that applying some natural language, maybe not real soon because you need a, a set of data to kind of work from but applying some natural language uh understanding of the data in the comment section may also be able to help inform um you know the the application migration you know i mean this is an extreme example but you know in the comment section you're putting in uh you know a uh, team is wildly geographically diverse right uh or team is all you know just started on the project two weeks ago you know things like that like things that you may not be capturing or don't know to capture yet right in the questionnaire um might be interesting to kind of start to look at from a natural language perspective uh you know basically like uh, i joke around about using ai to do uh, flame war detection right in various open source communities um same kind of idea right is you you can get sentiment you know those things out of it um the other question i had too was um uh oh new, nuts uh, uh phil phil we should bring langdon to the team do you have some <laughs> <Then> we should <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> my team we need his illustriousness here, here. Yeah, right, right. Uh, what are you doing next week do you have some uh free slots next week i think we need yeah. to talk <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, I have, um, I, like I said, I, I used to do a lot of this stuff uh, for a long time. Um, and you can see why I joined Red Hat uh, to get out of, uh, you know, get away from, from that uh, nightmare. Um, so yeah, so I just, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So one of the things that I find a little bit confusing is, okay, so I know the questionnaire part is Pathfinder. Is what's the overview app called? Is that Tackle or is that also Pathfinder? Well, the, the glue that holds it all together is the application inventory, and ultimately what we okay. need to do is, so we've got Pathfinder integrated in the application inventory, and essentially, um, 
We've got the so controls, a, Pathfinder, the application I. imagery of, of, of three different microservices. Yeah. Okay. And what we need to do, we've got the migration toolkit for applications, which is upstream is the wind-up project, which does the, 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 co the automated code analysis. And we need to bring that to the party so that it's integrated to the application inventory. So the idea being that within the application inventory, you could provide you know, the path to your enterprise archive files or the GitHub repository from which the application is built. And then you know you click an, an, an analysis button and wind up would run behind the scenes, uh, analyze your source code and generate a collection of reports that, that, that raise the awareness of any migration issues for whatever target you're working towards. Yeah. So sorry, just because I, I gloss over it because I know what it is, but can you explain for the audience what wind up is? Yeah, yeah. So again, um, I can do a brief demonstration if that's going to be helpful. Oh, that sure. Helpful? Yeah. I mean, I That'd think pictures definitely yeah. help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me share my so screen. So while, while you're okay. setting everything up, uh, Phil, I would say uh, mm -hmm. WindUp or MTA, which is the downstream distribution for WindUp, is an automated analysis tool that uh, can use both source code and binaries. And the idea behind this tool is to, you know, uh, measure the gap that you have from uh, a certain runtime towards uh, a, a, a certain target runtime so for example it was built back in the day uh, to help on migration from different uh, application servers uh, web logic web sphere towards eap that was the original uh, i would say purpose for the for the tool but now we have added a lot of rules that help uh, with uh, containerization uh, modernization everything related to 12 factor applications things like a spring boot to quarkus so we are basically reusing this uh, rules engine and this analysis engine with the purpose of application modernization as well. Okay. Um, and so at least, you know, and so this is primarily a Java focused application? For the moment, it yes. is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it can analyze any, any, any text file to be truthful. Uh, so, you know, config files and things of that nature, XML files that, that provide configuration. It doesn't necessarily just have to be Java class files. Um, but it is, as, as Ramon um, mentioned, its origins were all about getting workloads on AAP from other middleware providers. Or, um, and what it still does today very well is upgrades from one version of AAP to another version of AAP. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, um, hopefully you can see my screen again. Um, the this is the the web UI for uh, the migration to for applications. Um, we have a web console, we've got a Maven plugin, uh, it's available, it's not rated on OpenShift, and um, uh, we've got a CLI, obviously, and we've got uh, numerous IDE plugins, so we support uh, Code Ready Studio, uh, Eclipse, Eclipse Share, VS Code, and, and in July, we'll also have a plugin released for the IntelliJ um, IDE, so uh, it's it's really, uh, can be consumed in many different ways, but the web UI is probably the easiest way to demonstrate it and for people to understand the concepts. So we start by creating a thing called a project. And a project is just a way of, of, creating, uh, of grouping applications together that you're going to analyze for migrating to the same target. Yeah. And um, so uh, I'll call this one demo two. Yeah. You can give it a description if you want to, but you don't necessarily have to. This, the, first, the next thing you have to do is, is choose up which applications or, or, um, or directories contain the applications that you want to analyze. Um, I've obviously got some test data, um, and I'll pick a couple of um, sample applications that we um, we use when demonstrating. Click those three there. Yeah. So that's uploaded three applications that are going to be decompiled and then analyzed. And then the next thing, which is probably the most appealing of the screens, is all about choosing the target. Yeah, um, so what you can choose is is what what collections of rules you want to consider for execution when running against these applications. And um, the one that's chosen by default is EAP seven. Um, another collection of rules is for containerization, which contain the twelve factor app considerations. You click on this one, which will look for sort of window type file paths, Windows type file paths uh, in the application. The kind of line um, for example. Pardon me. Wrong line endings. Like, like hard return versus returns. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's other ones as well. So, um, on JDK, on JDK rules for Spring Boot to Corpus rules for making sure you've got the you've got the right version of 
uh, Spring Boot, if you're running Spring Boot applications on Red Hat runtimes. And there's other targets as well, but these are just the ones that have probably got the most highest profile and we want to, you know, really put in the face of the users, the ones that they're generally going to be selecting, yeah? When you click the next button, what it does, it comes, it, it, it runs behind the scenes, identifies all of the packages within the applications. There are many standard libraries that you that are provided and um, that we are aware of. Uh, and you would want to analyze those because really what you're interested in is just the business logic, you know, the application logic. You're not interested in analyzing the libraries that it's been built upon. And um, so right. you can interact and, and see which of these packages are or are not business logic, but by default, the wind-up application generally gets it right and you don't have to mess with this interaction at all. Then there's some sort of advanced options about uh, if you want to run, write some rules yourself because the application is a rules-based engine and um, looking for characteristics within code and when those characteristics are discovered it generates issues that provide content for the report. Um, there's lots and lots of cool rules delivered as, uh, as part of the application but customers can uh, add their own rules. So it's entirely extensible. Um, likewise, there's a set of labels, which I'll demonstrate in a second, which add value to the reports, uh, and you can add additional labels yourself as well. Um, there's a collection of advanced options, which will load hopefully in a second, um, which um, allow you to export the results to CSV and you know, um, you know, um, some sort of edge case type features uh, such as maverizing your project or keep your work in directories and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but all this, so, uh, is, is Phil, I, I have to say for us consultants on um, on the field and architects on the field, this ma mavenize uh, option has saved our lives uh, many times because really? you, you still find uh, lots of customers out there using and with no uh, dependency management. And yeah, you almost like you almost want to maven target like Quarkus, right? Like, you know, or like, um, you know, any like a, the opening blocks, oh, like having Maven as yeah. just a straight up target might not be a bad. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it makes sense. So yeah. what, what did you say you're, you were doing next week? Well, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, I had a couple of questions here that I was kind of, you know, wondering about is like, so. So where do I find the rules that have like that are triggered or the collection of rules i don't yeah. know what, quite the right word for quarkus migration let's say okay then. yeah so we've got a yeah we've got a, within the github repository for wind up there's a there's a wind up rule sets folder and it's structured um basically target then source so i just uh, let me just show what's on my on my um so this is the my clone of the github repository for the wind up rule sets uh -huh. and the way it's structured is basically uh, wind up rule sets, rules reviewed, target, so EAP7, and then the the, the subfolder is the source, yeah? Okay. So for any rules that migrate from EAP 7.2 to the latest version of EAP will be found within this folder, yeah? And these are the list of rules, yeah? So once you understand the uh, how the rules are structured, they're quite easy to navigate to. But when you generate the reports, what you can also see is the issues that are fired you can trace it back to the rule that fired it. So I'll demonstrate that in a second, actually. Um, so click on next, you get a confirmation button um, that um, will just give you a summarization of what you're going to be doing. So these are the applications you've set to analyze. These are the targets you're going to um, analyze with. These are the packages that will get analyzed. Yeah, and you haven't chosen any advanced options. And then if you click save and run, that will kick off the analysis. So it'll take me to another screen that gives me uh, a list, a process that you can follow and understand where we are the, with the analysis. But just like any good demonstration, what I will do is I will click to um, Everything another pre-prepared one. And this icon okay. here is the set of reports. Because I didn't yeah. break enough jokes, you know, for an, a full analysis. So <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was great. Uh, and then, then you start, then you start actually seeing the reports themselves. And these labels here allow you to see which technologies um, uh, are supported or unsupported or embeddable within each particular runtime. So whether it's JWS or JBoss or EAP, as I say, um, this gives you a key to give you an understanding of which of those technology tags are supported by those those runtimes, and you can create your own versions of these target labels, which was one of the options in the configuration. 
the thing that really is important is the issues list. Um, if you have a look at some of these issues, you can click on that. It'll tell you which file the issue is located in. You get a nice lengthy description of what needs to change with some reference materials. And if you wanted to drill into the detail of um, you know, why this particular issue has been generated, what's the rule behind it, click on the show rule. And actually, that's not, not the most readable of rules, but basically, there's a when condition that says, you know, when you see a reference to this particular um, uh, method within a method call, then uh, what you need to do is, is basically generate an issue. And the issue has a category, which indicates the severity, how much work's involved, gives a title and some, some related information that you saw in the last report. Yeah. Right. Um, so I would add that so, having these kind of tools that provide so much low level detail about the application portfolio is what enables, uh, you know, has enabled us in the past to, to successfully deliver this kind of larger scale migration project. So you are able to have with this kind of uh, level of detail done in an automated fashion, uh, you are somehow enabled to have a holistic view of the whole portfolio and you are able to identify all the technical uh, risks at a very early stage in order to design a migration methodology around, you know, how to solve these risks during the migration process. Yeah, well, and I particularly like um, that you have, uh, like one of the ones that I think is, you know, even though I'm, you know, biased, or, like somewhat biased, but um, is the Corcus one. Um, because like in so many ways, Corpus is not like running a normal Java application, except that it is. Um, so uh, knowing, knowing where those complexities are gonna lie is really important. And I don't think it's obvious, particularly when you're kind of at the outset, if you, you're thinking about, hey, I wanna migrate this thing to Corcus, um, because like, you know, it's, if, you're, you know, if you're a senior software developer, I think if you really think about it, you're like, oh, of course, that's why this problem lies in trying to run this particular Java application in Corcus, but you don't see it at all, or at least I didn't, right? When you're looking at the Java application and then you're thinking about, oh, I wanna move this over to Corcus, you know? Um, so the one that caught me really off guard was, um, uh, there's an in-memory database called H2. And if you're running that as a single container Corcus uh, enabled element, it, it won't work because uh, that, that H2 database um, doesn't have any place to write to disk. Um, so it's got these, you know, there's these weird things where it's like, oh, if I really got through it, you know, I could probably figure it out. But, you know, that's, that one's really interesting. Yeah, there's... I think containerization is probably in the same vein, um, yeah. but I have a lot more experience with moving things to containers. So maybe that's why it's less obvious. So we have a quasi question about the, the rules configuration. Um, Carlos says, if I'm not wrong, the Quarkus rules can be viewed through the UI also using the menu rules configuration. Is that accurate a statement? The, me the many rules? No, yeah. seeing the rules for, like, can you see a rules for a target platform right. by, there's, a, there's a, a UI element. Phil, does that ring a bell? Is he still here? Just over there? Yes, he's entirely right. There is okay. you can okay. you can you can view the rules. Um, uh, it's it's um, he's <laughs> yes. Um, well done, Carlos. I'm, I'm pleased you picked up picked us up on that one. He is a way of viewing all the rule sets that are going to be used in the analysis prior to actually kicking off the analysis. So you don't have to have the reports to see the rules with, via the UI. That is very true. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, and I yeah. also wanted to say, you know, we've been talking about what Tockle is today, but uh, there are a lot of exciting things coming up, uh, mainly from, from our IBM research colleagues, but also on our side in terms of uh, integration. So right now, what we are aiming at is to have this fully integrated experience to, from the application inventory to being able uh, for being able to assess the portfolio, which is something that we already have with uh, Pathfinder. And now we're working on the actual integration between WindUp and the application inventory. So we plan to, let's say, migrate WindUp under the Tackle umbrella and have everything fully integrated. And since uh, WindUp is such a great analysis tool, the IBM uh, team has developed a couple of uh, 
uh, analysis related tools. One of them, for example, is Diva, which is able to analyze the data layer from an application and basically detect all the uh, storage uh, dependencies an application might have and detect things like uh, distributed transactions and things like that and map them out and create graphs based on, on, on the dependencies that could uh, exist between applications uh, with, uh, with the same database, uh, you know, uh, transactions spanning across several databases or uh, across several different applications or middleware elements. That's what Diva is. It is a standalone tool now. It has already been published under Tackle. What we're trying to do is bring Diva as a first class citizen within the analysis flow uh, for Windup. Um, the same goes for uh, Tackle, uh, Tackle configuration discovery, which is, you know, uh, configuration files are usually something that we forget about in this kind of migration project. So we change the technology and then we struggle to change the configuration model between the two technologies. This uh, kind of tool, uh, what tries to do is to translate configuration files from uh, one format to the other to make them compatible to the target uh, technology. That's something that we also want to integrate uh, into the whole uh, wind-up analysis and transformation flow. And uh, I think the first MVP for uh, uh, TCD has been made available today on, on the Tackle repositories. And uh, we also talked about the application containerization advisor, the one that with natural language suggests the container image that you should be using based on the technology stack. And the last one, which for me is one of the most exciting ones, is the, um, the one related to uh, test-driven migration. So basically what this tool does is that it analyzes the source code of your application and is able to generate a test suite that creates some sort of functional profile of how your application behaves. So one of the key problems that we have when we are migrating uh, applications and we're performing source code changes is uh, somehow being able to warranty that the, the application behaves the same. So this yeah, is an definitely. automated way of creating a functional profile of how the application behaved uh, before the migration and then use it against the migrated version to see if it's still doing the same thing. That I think would be ridiculous. I mean, like one of the things I think people don't capture in a lot of this stuff, right, is that <clears throat> application even creation, much less modernization, but modernization in particular, uh, one of the biggest gating factors is usually testing, like QE, QA, um, and that resource, whether it be automated, whether it be people, whether it be whatever, but that resource being uh, so constrained that they can't take in more applications. And so as a result, even though you might have the developers to do the work, you might even have the code all done. You don't have anybody to actually validate that um, this thing does what it says it's going to do. Um, I saw countless applications that could not move off of the mainframes they were on because no one knew how to replicate the business logic that was encoded in the COBOL. Um, Which is and it's a common reassuring. problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and what I particularly like about that is that it's often at banks and insurance companies. Um, but, you know, different, different problem. Uh, so one of the things I was kind of thinking when you were kind of giving that list of these um, kind of application migration assessment kind of tools or whatever, is that it might be really useful if Pathfinder had a standard API or consumption model or whatever, because I what I have also seen over the years, right, is that almost everybody has written one of these as well in their specific little world, in their specific little company, um, or even really large company. Um, and, and they have this thing that they trust and that it might be super useful if not only could I plug wind up into it, but I could also plug in my custom homegrown thing if I did a little ETL on its output to get into the, the right format. And kind of setting a standard for that format means that then you can have lots and lots of plugins to it. Um, you know, or, or, you know, I don't, I don't know actually where this is kind of like reaching out of my space, but like when you look at, um, ah, I just blanked on the name of that company, but, uh, like we use a product in the Linux world, um, that's like a paid, you know, product to do security assessment, uh, as well as code assessment. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of wonder if there's like some sort of standard out there that, all of these analysis tools could kind of like all filter down to from an output perspective so that you can surface all of them in something like Pathfinder 
which then you can extrapolate even more so to say, okay, I got Pathfinder, which is telling me, you know, this application wants to do this thing, but then you can also slot in different pieces of the application, get a better understanding of what the effort level is, because now you've actually done analysis on the actual individual application. Um, you know, and then when, you know, the C-sharp version of Windup comes along, um, you know, then you, you have a really easy way to plug that in without having to make Windup understand C-sharp, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We, we're, we're still trying to figure out the uh, integration patterns uh, to make it easier for new projects to come on board to the whole tr uh, tackle umbrella. I would say we, we are trying to bring as many vendors, GSIs, customers out there to, to share their knowledge and, and to contribute to this. And we are very open to, to integrate any tools that any GSIs out there might have developed in the past to, to uh, you know, address these kind of problems. So yeah, we are definitely trying to figure out how to create some sort of generic enough integration layer for all the tools uh, to, you know, to ease the integration of any uh, external tool in the in the future. Right, right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I was going to ask a little bit more questions, but I want to take a pause for a second because it's about that time of the show where uh, we are running up on 10 o'clock. So I would like to pause for a moment and uh, share some sweet, sweet internet points. Because I'm everybody talking loves, about. <laughs> everybody loves the internet points. All right, so uh, for on you know for the sake of our guests, um, we like to uh, sorry um, we have a concept on the show that we call uh, sweet sweet internet points, and every uh, time we do an episode, uh, we like to share who our leaders are in submitting for internet points. You can get them a bunch of different ways um, by watching episodes and submitting the code that you see during the show. You can rewatch old episodes and look for the code there. Um, and you can, you know, uh, and, and submit those. Uh, I, I like the only word I can think of is postmortem, uh, which is definitely not the word I mean. Not the right <laughs> word there. Yeah. Not the right word. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, any episode from the past, you can also submit issues about shows you might like to see uh, or pull requests on uh, stupid bugs I have when we do shows that are more about coding. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, we have today's leaderboard uh, with Ooh. Narendev at 5,800 points. Uh, and Netherlands Hackham at 5,500 points. I don't know how much of the entertainment here is actually uh, me, you know, destroying uh, people's uh, nicks on the internet. Um, but I just dropped the codes uh, that are on the screen right now, but I also just dropped them into the chat. Hopefully they're the same. Yes, they are. Uh, and then Noah Friction and Joe Fuzz were both holding stable at 4,000 and 2,300 respectively uh we need to get them back we haven't seen them in a while uh yeah. then, so they're not collecting points and then uh detective conan kudo uh has uh missed and i actually talked to him uh in another channel uh and missed the last episode uh but hopefully he's back today we'll see he was um, back and, today he had to uh, run but he'll oh, okay points later Stupid he said work yeah. Um, and, uh, and then bacon fork is, uh, definitely catching up on, on the detective. So, uh, we, uh, we need a uh, detective to, uh, you know, keep under those points, maybe go back and watch the episodes they missed. Uh, it's so they can, uh, oh, yeah. uh collect Speaking notes of, in case you missed an episode. They're all on YouTube. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, they are all on YouTube. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're going to do the shout out, click like and subscribe because, uh, you know, for the corporate overlords, uh, not really. It's because we want to we also like the props of, uh, you know, y'all watching the show. Um, so thanks so much, everybody, for always being here. Um, and to our guests, I just wanted to ask kind of one more question, which is that it sounds like you have a ton of plans. Is there a roadmap somewhere? Is there a, a place where I can go and see where you're, where you're hoping to go um, or a way I can say, oh, I want that versus this? Um, where is there a way I can kind of try to help participate in where you're going with the project? Absolutely. Uh, we are trying to enforce the open source spirit uh, as much as possible in the, in the project. So basically what we're doing is 
uh, doing our planning sessions in the open. And that, that goes for the whole conveyor uh, community and awesome. for all the tools inside the, the, the community. So a uh, couple of weeks ago, we did the June planning uh, session and you can find the output from that session and the roadmap that we presented uh, on the conveyor uh, YouTube channel. So the whole session is there. You can see all the, all the new stuff that we presented and the whole roadmap for the upcoming months. And we will be having another roadmap presentation session on Friday. And I think this is going to be streamed by OpenShift TV as well. So, you yes. know. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I like that, uh, that channel. I've, I've heard of it before. Uh, yeah. Um, it's a good channel. I hear the uh, cool. So, and then I assume as part of the planning kind of roadmap of the videos or whatever, like, like where, where do I actually go participate in the community itself in a sense? Um, you know, cause I think you mentioned that there's a Slack channel. Um, yeah, we, uh, well, to, to get all the news, we have a website with this, uh, conveyor.io and mm -hmm. we also have a, a Slack channel in the, uh, Kubernetes Slack, uh, which is conveyor, okay. um, conveyor. And, and there we are. Okay, cool. I mean, so one of those things, uh, the reason I like to ask that question, even if it's findable is, um, because I may discover a conveyor on IRC that people occasionally take a look at right but where i want to know you know what i want our audience to know right is like where should i go where people actually are where your team generally communicates with you know yourselves or people who are tangential to the team um because you know now that we have six billion different chat uh server types um it can be uh, it can be a little challenging that will be a Slack for sure. You can find okay. Phil, you can find myself, the whole engineering team, not awesome. only the Red Hat engineering team, but also the people from IBM Research are there as well. Mm -hmm. So if you if you have any kind of doubts or, or problems with the technology, we're all there and we are happy to help everyone. Right. And also cool. if you have any kind of idea you would like to share with the community, maybe that's the place to engage with us or uh, getting into the conveyor.io uh, website and, and signing up for the mail list. Those are the usual communication channels with the community and okay. also with the Tuckle team. Awesome. Awesome. Chris, were there any other questions from the uh, chat? Uh, there's a question about OKD. I'm going to ask. Ahmed, please check in with the, there's an OKD Slack. Uh, I can find it for you, uh, hopefully, maybe. I thought I was in it, but I'm not. But yeah, there's an OKD Slack that you can go join and ask your questions about uh, .NET 4 and OKD. But I, I think it would be supported. I don't know why it wouldn't be, because we can do .NET Core and OpenShift, right? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um... No, actually, I think I talked to somebody about it. Uh, so yeah, there's, I mean, as far as what's running in the container, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, like for the most part, you can mm -hmm. just kind of run it. Uh, so as long as you're using a base image that runs .NET Core, then it should work fine. Um, but yeah, you can, I was looking forward to, were you looking for the OpenShift like commons? Slack, or were you looking for the Kubernetes or the CNCF? Uh, the common Slack. Uh, let me oh. grab it. Yeah. I think I got it too. Hang on. It's in here somewhere if I can find it. Oh boy. Okay. Well, that might be a bridge too far, maybe. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I am. Uh, I jokingly refer to the fact that I, uh, I did .NET for a long time. Um, and I actually, uh, there's uh, two Red Hat employees. One is uh, Gunnar Hellickson and one is uh, David Etz. Um, and uh, they're pretty well known with inside Red Hat, but they also, they've done a podcast together for years. Um, and it's really good a lot of the time. Uh, but I was on it a couple of times. And one of the times I was talking about .NET and how I really like C Sharp as a language. Uh, and uh, basically it played me out. Um, and it was really quite amusing because this is before .NET was available on Linux. Um, so, but I was basically at the time lamenting the fact that I can't do C Sharp on Linux anymore, but now I can. So. Yes, you All right. do. All right. and I also regarding .NET, uh, I have to say it is not in our, I would say, upcoming roadmap, but I know the move to Cube guys are, are working on that. So maybe we could leverage the kind of technology they're using within uh, Tackle to, to help on those migrations as well. So that's something we're, we're thinking, we're definitely thinking about. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's just 
the the major reason I'm bringing it up is right. It's like you know the two languages are you know C sharp and Java are neck and neck in most enterprises, right? So you know you're gonna ha- you're gonna see a lot of C sharp. You're also in many enterprises gonna have both, right? And uh, you know and being able to have you know a tool chain that migrates either um, is probably gonna be helpful. Um, Absolutely. But I think that's. Should we wrap the show? I mean, is there anything else you wanted to Any, bring up? Yeah. Anybody else want to say anything here? Make sure we got all our eyes dotted and T's crossed before we get off the air. Ducks. Mind yeah, up. Ducks in a row. That kind of thing. No? Good. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. This has been very informative. I've learned some things, so I'm always happy about that. Uh, up next on the channel is the Ask an OpenShift Admin office hours. Today we're discussing uh, certif- SSL certificates on OpenShift. Uh, we kind of had some issues with that topic uh, getting streamed the other day, so we're going to tackle it, no pun intended, again. Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> so yeah, stick around. Uh, another hour or so, it will uh, be live. And uh, yeah, your, your .NET container should work. And open or okd so yeah all right folks thank you very much for joining thank you phil thank you ramon thank you langdon as always um stay tuned uh join us on our discord you can find us all there and when in doubt check out the calendar to see what's coming up next and thanks everybody yeah without further ado thank you thanks for having us thank you Bye-bye.